Welcome back everybody. So today we're going to talk about section 3 of chapter 13, coping with stress. Uh, first talking about social factors in dealing with stress. There was a, a lot of research done um, and those research um, ac those research studies that are listed in your book are just some of the ones of dealing with um, close relationships and how that helps with stress and positivity in someone's life. There's a lot of studies out there that support this information. Um, Holt Lundstad um, found that people socially isolated were twice as likely to die, just like um, being socially, socially isolated was like smoking 15 cigarettes a day, which is pretty alarming um, kind of effect on health. Uh, chronic loneliness, uh, they found, predicts poorer physical and mental health and a higher death rate and decreased cognitive function. And we talked about decreased cognitive function when we talked about aging and development and the idea of neurogenesis. And in the 1950s, college students, uh, they found a study, they, they uh, asked them to rate their parents' love, and then about a century later, asked them um, and found a health report of each one of them, and 87% of those who rated love as low had serious physical disease um, compared to the 25 who rated their, their love high. Um, those people just had it from uh, other reasons. Um, but it's um, pretty interesting to look at the effect of close relationships on stress. Social support also, um, I'm talking about that, influences our ability to tolerate stress through the resources provided um, to people in times of need. Um, th that of course is very uh, applicable to our situation we have now with coronavirus and we're gonna be relying on each other for that as um, some of those services are limited. I know my husband was giving, um, people were giving out toilet paper to staff members at his business because some people didn't have any. Um, so having that social network is really important. And the more diverse the social network, the better health benefits um, because you have different types of relationships and you find different uh, sources of support in different areas of your life. Um, and you have greater resistance to respiratory disease, stroke, cardiovascular disease, especially in women, and lower dementia and cognitive loss in old age. And we talked about how exercise and activity and just uh, not being isolated um, helps with um, degeneration of neurons and brain tissue. Social isolation seems to be as detrimental, um, and this is not a new thing, this has been around for a while, um, as uh, smoking and alcohol abuse and obesity and um, not exercising. So how social uh, support benefits health, you can modify uh, or you modify your appraisal of uh, stressors um, as a significant or a degree of its threat if you have people around um, and the presence of others decreases the intensity of that stressor and can influence whether we have a negative or a positive mood and um, that's really important in promoting emotion, a positive emotion, enhancing self-esteem, and feeling that you have control of the situation. Relationships and, and sources of stress. Um, as you can see in the picture there, there's all kinds of relationships we know that in our own lives, uh, they are sources of stress, whether they're friends or family or coworkers or peers in our um, own classes. Um, and that um, they can be sources of stress because of the inter negative interactions with other people. Um, they can cause some true psychological distress. Um, and married couples, uh, as we talked about, are healthier and seemingly than single, um, but marital conflict can be really a big source of stress, especially affecting um, women and their physical health. Oh, there's a little kitty cat. So Karen Allen, uh, I couldn't get a picture of my cat on there, but she look, he looks like that. His name is Hunter. Um, so the quality of relationships is really important. And, and Karen Allen, I thought this was a really um, neat study, um, found the presence of a favorite dog or a cat was more effective than a spouse or a friend, which is kind of funny. But that pet is usually non-judgmental and has unconditional support. Um, and so the more quality of those relationships that you have, that you have unconditional support, um, the better um, those will help you in, um, in being effective against stress. So gender differences in the effects of social stress, like who do you turn to when you need help? Men, they found in general, um, rely on their spouse and their partner, and women um, tend to gravitate clo to close friends. 
Um, there is more vulnerability of women to aspects of their social support, though, because they do have more diverse um, social networks and larger networks. So women are more likely to serve as providers of, of support. So that can come with stress. Um, and that sort of um, nurturing part of um, how women are innately like that. Um, they're more li likely to suffer from stress contagion effect. Sounds like something we should have for the coronavirus, but um, becoming upset at events that happen to other people. Um, and, and all kidding aside, I, I thought about this example. And as you look to the right, um, remembering Sandy Hook and the children that were killed by gun violence in that um, elementary school, I can remember becoming very upset, um, visibly upset and crying over just seeing these kids. Um, and I think that has to do with something to be a teacher but also um, just being a mother um, and finding that connection with people I, I don't even know. Um, so you can imagine how people become upset with people that they care about. Um, and in that instance, it was, it was people that I just identified with because they were parents. Um, and then three, um, women are more vulnerable because they have a larger intimate social network. So there's more chances for distress things to create stress. Um, men are more distressed, studies have found, um, through things that have happened to their immediate family. So providing an effective social support, um, appropriate social support can help people in crisis. And there's definitely ways that we um, can and don't want to do that. Um, so we'll go over those. Um, the three categories of social support um, include emotional. So, you know, showing expressions of concern and empathy and positive regard. So, if um, there's some people in your life that are feeling very stressed about being um, in social isolation and um, you know really worrying about the effects of the economy um, because of the coronavirus or um, their own health, you know these are ways that you could show support. So empathy and and positive regard, um, tangible direct assistance, transportation, lending money, meals, childcare, household tasks. Um, lending some toilet paper out to someone and so forth. Um, maybe even uh, a neighbor, um, if they cannot go to the grocery store because of the coronavirus, like if offering some assistance um, safely to get them um, what they need. And then thirdly, the information, some advice or even resources that people might need um, if they um, need information on how to get in touch if they, they think they have symptoms or whatever it would be. Um, resources on, um, you know, how their doctor's offices are, are conducting things. So those are three main categories we could give support even um, today uh, when we are dealing with family and friends. Support typically um, perceived as help uh, and helpful by people under stress is if we are good listeners and we show interest and concern about what's going on and we ask questions to help the person um, feel like that we are engaged in expressing feelings without giving our own input or expressing our own feelings about ourselves, but asking about them, um, and, um, express understanding of why the person is upset without giving any advice to it, but just expressing your understanding that they are upset and, and validating their um, feelings, um, expressing affection. Um, obviously, we're not doing hugs right now for outside people, but um, certainly we can find some way of, of showing affection to people and in certain ways. Um, willing to spend time so you can help them, like some people are just kind of blow off people, um, but really investing time can really uh, mean something to someone and then helping with uh, tasks and responsibilities like we talked to like tangible things or information. Um, some of us make these huge mistakes um, because we kind of get in the, our own way. You know, knowing what not to say is really important. So you may be experiencing some people in your life that are really um, dealing with some real stress, either from job situation, um, if their companies or restaurants or things are shutting down, they're laying off people. And um, so when we think about that, think about these li the list of things. You know, um, one thing that would not be perceived as being um, helpful or being unhelpful is giving advice when not requested. People sometimes just want you to listen. Um, and not give any advice, they just want to be heard. Um, saying, uh, I know how you feel. Um, not all of our situations are identical, so saying that um, can seem unhelpful. Uh, talking about your problems or even joking or acting cheerful about something um, kind of minimizes the importance of the problem. Don't worry, everything's going to be okay. You know, that made me not what the person's looking for. Um, Really, turn off could be some philosophical or religious interpretation of it, 
Um, that's not, you know, validating how they're feeling and the situation that's at hand. Um, making a big deal out of the support you're giving. Um, the most effective form of social support um, they found is invisible support where the person is actually not aware that you have helped. Okay, so let's talk about coping. Um, there is a video um, to watch uh, on uh, Canvas that you can watch about coping. Um, give some sort of not, not as many detailed um, information that we have in front of us, but um, more, you know, something that could be used um, for people in our own lives that can simplify all these studies that we talk about. Um, and this um, coping refers to ways in which we try to change our circumstances and make them more favorable. Um, it's very complex. We use a lot of multiple types of coping mechanisms, so not one is really um, more important than the other. Um, and we can switch coping strategies. It's okay to do that. We don't have just one that we might use in every situation. And we do that because we've used that appraisal um, of the situation and the stressor to figure out what we need and what kind of resources we need. Um, and we evaluate whether a decision has made the situation worse or um, better um, and we'll then reapply or uh, a different uh, coping strategy if we need to. Maladaptive coping, um, it produces self-defeating outcomes and it will prolong stress, we really need to make sure that when we're using coping strategies, we're not using the maladaptive version of it. So for instance, a person dwelling on losing a partner and then they end up just closing themselves off because they don't wanna get hurt again from new relationships. It's a coping mechanism, but it's not one that's going to have a great outcome and it might prolong stress if that person actually wants a new relationship um, to form. Okay, adaptive coping strat uh, strategies have many functions in our own lives. Um, they involve realistic evaluations of a situation. Um, and then you can determine what can be done to uh, minimize the impact of that. Um, and we really, like we said before, um, really creating that personal growth. And we want to develop a emotional tolerance to negative um, life events and, and sometimes things can seem very overwhelming because we have not had too many of those moderate stressors and again remember those moderate stressors are important in us developing coping strategies and that's important for us to be able to maintain um, balance in our life and and that self-esteem and confidence that we're able to get through challenges um, and it's also and uh, we need and coping strategies are an effort to preserve important relationships Sometimes the people in our own lives create those uh, stressors, um, but we, by using coping strategies, we, we wanna preserve those family relationships, those sibling relationships that um, are good for longevity and our social networking. So um, one of those coping strategies is the problem-focused uh, coping strategy. So um, these are aimed at managing or changing a threat or a stressor. So we're trying to actually change the situation by solving the problem. Um, and they're most effective if you exercise some control over the successful situation. So remember we talked about how control is important for people feeling um, positive about a situation. And so these are good because people do feel like they are making a difference. They have um, the ability to change um, a situation. So plan, uh, planful problem solving is the idea of analyzing the situation, identifying potential solutions, and then implementing them. And it's viewed, stressors are viewed just as a problem. And so um, they are fixable in that sense. Um, confrontive uh, coping is um, one in which people confront um, those. And you can see people on the right hand side of your screen. Um, the top one and the bottom one, look, the tone is very different. Um, the confrontation um, that's going on at the top is a lot more direct and assertive. Um, in terms of maybe um, confronting a um, older parent about whether they are gonna go into a nursing home or um, their financial situation um, or being socially isolated and why that's important. Um, and we do that, it's not hostile. You can tell the gentleman is assertive and um, open, um, but uh, the person at the bottom uh, is very turned off um, he's not even looking at his partner and, and she has um, a more hostile um, tone to it. And hostile individuals often can, uh, engage in confrontive coping because that's sort of their nature. 
Um, but when they do this, they could damage future relationships by using those um, and generating negative emotions. Okay, emotion-focused coping skills um, are often um, are used when we don't have control. We it, the stressor is not a problem uh, seen. It's uh, that we can solve. It's one that we have no control over. Um, an example of that is my husband having cancer, and there's no control over that situation. You just have to roll with it. So um, you turn to controlling your emotional response to the situation and directing your efforts to relieving or regulating um, how that emotional response um, it, um, it happens. Um, and it doesn't change the problem, um, but it will make you feel better. So when my husband contracted or um, was diagnosed with cancer, we don't have control of that situation, but it depends. We decided that we were going to focus on the positives of life. Um, a lot of people commented on how our response was very positive um, and it made a huge difference in how we functioned and were able to get through that challenge um, um, and grow from that challenge because we were able to um, have a better um, regulation of those emotions. So some of the coping mechanisms um, under emotion focus, uh, first of all, is escape avoidance. This is where you shift your attention away from the stressor to another activity that for the moment is going to neutralize those emotions in the short run so that you have a time to kind of think about and um, of, of how to sort of cope with that situation. Um, in the short run, it's good, especially if that stressor is brief and limited and you know that there's no consequences to just sort of shifting your attention away from it. So things like that would be exercise, studying, um, hobbies, and work, kind of getting yourself redirected um, for a moment. Um, maladaptive forms of escape avoidance uh, might include uh, excessive street, uh, sleeping or drug use or alcohol use. Um, and these are really counterproductive, especially if it's a long-term um, problem uh, because uh, you're not using more positive ways to uh, redirect uh, emotional responses. Um, this can long run can lead to poor adjustment, depression, and anxiety over these uh, stressors. Okay, two others are social seeking support and distancing. Um, so social seeking support, turning to friends to have that uh, emotional response be regulated. We know that those social networks help with that. Um, that could be relatives, other people, um, and you're looking for emotional, tangible, or informational support in those um, instances to bring down that emotional response. And then distancing, uh, acknowledging a stressor, but a stressor, but attempting to minimize or eliminate its emotional impact. So this is really helpful in high stress uh, occupations. There's lots of um, training videos for people that go into, you know, uh, disaster areas or in, um, things uh, uh, that are be very high stress in terms of anxiety of what they're going to see. Um, and find. Um, so rescue workers, they'll have a lot of those training videos on how to deal with stress um, and using breathing exercises and so forth. Um, other things you can do is, is sort of that idea of positive attitude um, and finding humor in life, so telling jokes um, and so forth. Um, uh, that can also help um, in just having that more positive attitude, and that's what we sort of did um, with uh, my husband's cancer, we're really uh, trying to find uh, more happiness in life than, than negativity. And then also there's uh, a, one way that I, I used uh, distancing when I was in high school, and that is uh, in discussing something that's stressful in a detached way um, or in an um, intellectual way. I used the detached way. I had, unfortunately, I had a, a friend of mine um, get into a car accident when I was in high school. And I can remember going into school the next day after he had passed away, and um, I removed myself from the situation. Like I was talking about him in a detached way, like I didn't really even know him. And oh, guess what happened to um, so and so? And um, yeah, it was a really horrible accident. And, and I was one of his closest friends, and so it was a really weird reaction for me. But it was my coping mechanism so that I could deal with the emotion of that day because otherwise I would have broken down, which I, I did. Um, but in that instance, I remember really feeling like very in control of my emotions because I distanced myself um, and when people started to talk about his passing. Okay, and then um, another uh, to our denial and positive reappraisal. So denial, uh, 
definite refusal to acknowledge the problem even exists. These are really um, issues because they can compound and make a, a problem worse um, because some of those things require immediate action. So ignoring an F in a class due to missing assignments and just like um, I know I've talked to students and they say, oh, I don't know I have any assignments due. And they, they know they do. Um, they're just in that denial phase and it helps them to cope with, you know, feeling guilty or inadequate and so forth. Um, positive reappraisal um, is the most constructive coping strategy, although not every strategy is good for everyone in every instance. But um, you try not to minimize the negative emotional aspects of the situation but you definitely focus on the positive meaning of it. What are you going to get out of going through this challenge? Um, and that's like that growth mindset um, and personal growth opportunity that we've talked about and how failure is, um, you know, is failure and it's negative, um, but you turn it around and say, well, I'm going to learn from that situation because uh, challenges are going to make me stronger. Um, so growth mindset and finding that opportunity. So that cartoon there where she has all these urgent and more urgent, you know, work piling up. And she says, I have a lot of excitement in my, in my life. I used to call it tension, but I, but I feel a lot better now that I call it excitement. So kind of redirecting yourself um, to look at life in a more positive manner. And then um, things related to emotional uh, focused coping strategies in terms of religion. Um, the first one being uh, a lot more uh, positive results for positive religious coping, where a lot of people seek comfort in prayer or in their religious community. Um, and people see challenges are, as God's plan or um, testing their faith or there's some kind of spiritual meaning. Something has been placed in front of them um, to overcome so they can become a better person. Um, so they feel a, a sense of control over that stress, which we've talked about, have really good outcomes for people um, feeling um, more optimistic and resilient against stress. Um, and they can have some positive re results like lowering levels of stress and improving mental and physical health and enhancing well-being. On the other hand, negative religious coping, we've heard people you know, start to question their beliefs as a, the passing of a, a young friend. Um, or somebody um, who shouldn't uh, um, be dying at their age and they become very angry or somebody who's sick um, and they believe they're being punished by God. Um, and so this actually works in the, in the opposite and increases stress. Um, there's poor health and due to negative emotions, which we've talked about. Negative emotions do have an effect on your physical and mental health and um, decrease uh, well-being. Okay, um, and just in adding something, um, I know we've talked about this a little bit about stress and positivity, and we've seen a, a big pattern with if we use positive emotions, we deal with stress, we have um, better physical health and mental health as a result. And one of the strategies um, we've talked about, and there's um, quite a bit of research on this, is uh, using a gratitude list, making a list of at least 10 items, uh, events, people, or um, items that you're thankful for. Um, even trivial ones can have a, a, a nice effect um, when we come up with 10, like a good parking space or good health and so forth. And you can see those, that gratitude list that's there, I mean, hot showers, warm slippers, um, wildlife, ability to be me, something a little bit bigger, dance, pets, friends, books, you know, all kinds of things. Um, and note how your body sensations begin to change as you sort of look at all these positive things in your life. Um, and this research has sh shown that you'll become more relaxed and calm and you focus your lens and your brain will um, actually change to be looking at positive things instead of negative things. And the research has shown if you do this for 30 days, you can actually change that pattern of your brain to be looking at more positivity in your life. And just as we've seen, that positive emotion has a huge effect on um, better health and better relationships and stress and actually depression. It's really some, some neat stuff that you can do um, to create some more positivity um, and recognizing uh, positivity in your own brain. Okay, so what's the best strategy? As we said before, there's no single best. Um, and the best thing is to be really flexible and to try to fine tune your strategy to meet the needs of a particular situation or stressor. And to note that you might use multiple coping strategies. Um, usually people start with the emotional focus, 
Um, emotions are, you know, really heightened, especially with fight, fight or flight and sympathetic uh, nervous system kick, kicking in. Um, you've got to get that emotion sort of like redirected and then you can step back and do the problem solving because your prefrontal cortex is not involved um, when that amygdala is going and um, all those hormones are going, um, stress hormones are uh, going in your body. Um, so once we get that emotion refocused and we get that um, parasympathetic uh, system to, to kick in and bring us down, then we can proceed the problem focused strategies to help um, find those needed solutions. So gender differences um, is really kind of interesting to look at, you know, what women do in terms of the coping strategies versus men. Biologically, we all go through the hormonal and sympathetic nervous system activation. It's always the same biological action that happens, but behaviorally, people act really differently. So the interesting part was when Shelley Taylor kind of looked at this and some other studies were done about why uh, genders um, had different coping strategies. Um, she later looked at the evolutionary theory and how uh, women are, are, are sort of looking for promoting survival of both them and their, and their offspring. Um, and so fight or flight is not really an adaptive behavior for women in that evolutionary theory. Um, for women who seek out partners and care for children in a nurturing way when there's stressful situations. As we said before, men tend to uh, isolate themselves while women you know, want to see uh, that interaction with their partners and then also you know, caring for, ch for children. Um, so we really don't see them using fight or flight uh, like men do. Um, so again, men are gonna use more of the fight and flight and women, uh, as they came up with, are gonna use the tend and befriend um, response. Tend is quieting and caring for offspring and blending into the environment as, as a way to cover up, um, take cover from the threat to protect the children. You can see that there where the little character is saying, come on everybody in um, and tending to the young. Um, and animals do this as well. Uh, animal mothers do this as well, as you can see. And then befriending, you know, you've got um, you know, everyone turning to a social group for support and using those social networks uh, for resources. And because women have those extensive, intimate social networks, they are able to get those resources and protect themselves and, ch and their children. And then why is there a different response um, in general? So it's not just the evolutionary theory, there's um, some biological reasons for that. If we go back to the love hormone, um, uh, oxytocin, so this hormone is definitely higher in levels in females and oxytocin uh, is associated because it is a love hormone is associated with maternal behaviors um, and so that those sort of nurturing behaviors and it has a common effect on both males and females it's just that females have more of it um, and they did a study where they injected men with oxytocin um, that before a stressful procedure was given and, and it definitely uh, brought down their anxiety and lessened their cortisol um, uh, levels. Um, so with females feeling calm and promoting those material, those maternal behaviors, um, which are high in um, nursing mothers, but also in pregnant women, um, and the idea of hugging and touching that stimulates that oxytocin. And if they are participating in the associated behaviors of oxytocin, like maternal behaviors, then they are hugging and touching, and so they are getting even more oxytocin. It all seems to turn down the need for fight or flight for women, that women are gonna use tend and befriend instead. And culture and coping strategies, it makes a lot of sense that the differences between individualistic and um, culture, uh, collectivist uh, cultures. Um, so individualistic emphasize personal autonomy and responsibility, that, that's our responsibility to deal with our own problems. So we tend to not seek those social support. We're very strong, independent people. Um, and so we emphasize, you know, the, the emphasis is over control of the situation. Something happens, we take control of the situation. Um, so we tend to favor in the United States more problem-focused strategies to change the situation to fit um, our own, that are gonna fit our own goals. Um, the collectivists in, in completely opposite, we know they're, they're more family and community oriented. So it makes sense um, that their coping strategy is gonna be a more emotional coping strategy because it's not about controlling the situation. It's not about fitting it to your own goals. It's about, that's the way it goes. Um, 
it's about accepting one's fate and that's just a bad um, situation I mean you make the best of it um, and then again they want to emphasize control on your reactions and emotions no no outward emotion uh, emotional um, outbursts and so forth um, the Japanese for instance as they said approach a situation you know that's stressful you need to do it in a mature flexible and uh, ser uh, a serenity in terms of serene way that you deal with that uh, and not showing outward emotion. So in order to minimize the effects of stress, there are some strategies that we can take for ourselves and also um, express to other people, especially in this time um, where we're in this uh, lockdown in our homes, um, possibly not coming back to school again. Um, a lot of people are out of work, might be starting to lose jobs, and we're going to start seeing that stress. You can be an advocate for your friends and your family um, by giving them these few tips. So definitely avoiding any uh, or minimizing stimulants. Having drinking coffee all day and energy drinks and even smoking can be the opposite. Nicotine and some of these are stimulants, and so they work against you. They actually increase your heart rate and your blood pressure, so you're going to feel more anxious. Um, you guys need to get out there and exercise regularly and get your family to that. Even if you're sitting in the home, um, I had one of my friends who lives in Florida. It was the funniest thing I've ever seen. Her, her 75-year-old uh, dad was just power walking around the house. Um, he doesn't want to leave the house because he's in the older generation and he was doing everything he can. Um, get videos on online and um, do them together, but get some exercise, get outside um, in, your, in your own uh, lawn and do all kinds of regular exercise. And that's gonna produce less stress hormones. And those having those less stress hormones in your bloodstream are gonna um, lessen all the physical effects that stress has on you. We still wanna be in a good sleep cycle. Don't forget, even though you don't have school to get up to, Keep that regular sleep cycle that you've been having, maybe sleep in a little bit, but um, get up, go to bed, get some good rest um, and so forth. That's going to help your immune system also. It's also going to help you concentrate um, and tell your, your, your mom or dad or um, people in your family, you know, just getting uh, rest will help with them dealing with the stressful situations. Um, and it's going to promote that resistance as well. Um, the last thing we'll talk about is how we, we talk about meditation and relaxation. Um, we've been talking about this all year and um, using some of those focus uh, um, alpha beta music um, or meditation. And in this section, they really um, uh, go into the mindfulness uh, meditation. Um, and it's definitely a technique where you, you know, are really recognizing the thoughts that you have, but then we're disengaging with those and we're really focusing on clearing our mind um, and um, talk, and focusing on the breathing and the physical aspect of breathing um, for a few minutes to get ourselves calm. And so the way that we do that, because we're gonna be doing an exercise in a few minutes uh, where you're going to do some meditation and then reflect on that. Um, yes, you're gonna do meditation, I told you to. Um, so when you're doing it, you wanna, uh, and it's gonna guide you through this. I, I gave you a video that's really guiding you through it um, so that you don't have to remember all this, but you wanna sit in a relaxed, upright position. So you don't wanna be laying down, so you're you know, falling asleep. It's only gonna be a 10 minute um, uh, relaxation exercise that you're gonna do. Um, so you wanna sit somewhere upright in a quiet place and close your eyes and just relax all your neck and um, back muscles and so forth. And you're gonna focus on your breathing as the primary attention. So all the movement of your body, like and all the breath that's coming in, your movement of your, of your diaphragm and your stomach and all that, you're gonna recognize all that. And you're gonna focus just on that for 10 minutes. Um, if you have some other thought, you know, that you're just going through your mind, something you have to do, something you're worried about um, and so forth, you let it enter your mind, but then you refocus on the breathing, the physical sensation of breathing. Um, if you're having a hard time with that, focus on counting your breaths. Um, and then um, usually what you wanna do is start five minutes, we're gonna do 10 minutes, and then you work your way up to 20 and 30. And I know I've said this before, but a lot of studies have shown that 30 to 45 minutes a day can have a dramatic effect. Um, not for everyone, but they've seen a lot of studies where you know, 70 to 80% of people are lessening anxiety and getting off of de uh, depression medicine because of meditation, um, because of breathing um, and so forth. Um, and it also can increase attention. 
because you're focusing your brain on something for a, um, a few minutes. And so that can help when you're sitting in class um, or trying to get some work done that your brain doesn't kind of wander off and it's going to fight that um, social ADD that's happening because of our cell phones. So benefits of meditation, um, it can reduce pain and enhance your immune system. It reduces feelings of depression, anxiety, anger, and confusion. It can increase your blood flow and slow your heart rate. It can provide a sense of calm, place, and balance. It can even help reverse heart disease and help control your thoughts and increase your energy. And of course, we're talking about it because it can reduce stress. So what you're going to do is a couple of activities here. You're, and this is the uh, end of um, the lecture for today, um, and the end of the chapter. And so you're going to go back into Canvas, and you're going to do a couple of activities um, to end the chapter. First of all, you're going to be watching um, and participating in a meditation exercise. Again, it's going to guide you through it. The guy's a little funny, so don't laugh, but like recognize their laughter and then kind of focus on the music and what he's saying. Um, and it's going to guide you through 10 minutes of meditation. And then after that, you are going to, and it says submit a media recording on here. Just ignore that. I have the, the directions on um, Canvas for you. You're just going to answer these questions um, uh, instead uh, on a file because you're going to put that next to the next exercise I'm going to give you. So you, after the meditation exercise, you're going to then think about how did the meditation exercise make you feel? Did you have any benefit from the exercise? How, how does meditation reduce stress? And how is it supported by research and information you just learned? So tie it back into the chapter. You're going to type those on a file um, and do those as part A meditation exercise. And then that's the guided information. And then underneath that is part B, um, Joseph Lewis case study. I have a video on Canvas that you're going to watch. And you're going to watch and write a one-page reflection on Lewis's experiences with stress and his coping skills. Um, he's someone that grew up in Liberia and has had uh, many different um, ACEs or adverse childhood experiences in his life. And then he has some coping strategies. And so on Canvas, it's going to tell you um, some specific questions that you're going to answer regarding um, Lewis to show uh, what you know about his situation. Can you analyze him? And then the last thing you're going to do is you're going to uh, submit that meditation exercise and the John Lewis uh, case study, and you submit that on for our classwork for the day. And then you're going to exit out of that and go into the uh, assessment and project for chapter 13. And this will be due on the test date and because you're not having to really study as much uh, for the test. Um, it'll be due on that day and you can um, study uh, as well. Um, and, and so forth for that shorter test we're going to have. So for this, um, you have been asked to create a public service announcement um, and what information would you find important to share with others? So um, you want to be informative in the public service announcement and detailed. You also want to be persuasive and you also want you know, to prevent them from having any mental or physical illness and to promote how to promote their well-being. So you want to you know, get them to do the things that we know reduce stress in our lives. So the task is you're going to review all the information regarding stress from the chapter and decide what information you would want to share with others. Remember, be creative about that. You know, what are some things out there that people really need to know um, and use those, uh, that information, any studies that you want to put in there or information about gender and, and culture and so forth. That would really make it very rich in its public service announcement. So don't just make it sort of surface level. Um, and then you're going to create a public service announcement on stress and submit that to Canvas uh, in that assignment. And those can be all kinds of different uh, options. Get creative with what you're doing. Um, I put an option if you want to click on the submit button, a Canvas media recorder will, will pop up where you press on media, media recorder and you'll see yourself um, from your camera on your computer. And I'll say record and you can try it as many times as you want. It looks like, like a selfie um, kind of TikTok type, type of thing. You can put some props if you want and, you know, come up with little signs that you want to use for that media recorder if you want to do that. And then, again, you can re-record if you don't like it and redo and then submit. The other option is what I'm doing right now is PowerPoint and then a voiceover on the slides. You can add some music in there if you want. 
Um, you can actually do a video, which a lot of you are really um, good at, and upload that to YouTube and submit that as a web, a web URL. Um, and also you can make a cartoon if you want. So Pow Powtoon is a good little program to use, and you can create a, a cartoon on stress with all kinds of information on it. And that would also be a URL that you could um, uh, submit as well. Uh, any other suggestions, let me know. If you have any questions, email me. Um, you can even make it about the coronavirus, which would be kind of fun um, and apropos for what we're doing. I hope everybody has a wonderful day, and if you have any questions, let me know. See you later.